this morning, uh, one of the things that we believe very strongly around here, and I want us to get better and better at it, is that um, God is moving in everybody who shows up that wants God to move. God is moving in that person. And um, there's a great power in, in our own personal stories. You know, the Bible calls them testimonies. And today we, we're going to get privileged really to hear the testimony of somebody that God has been moving in in a while here. And uh, somebody that I'm really just really honestly proud to know. And BJ, if you'd come on up. And uh, you guys, I uh, just want you to listen for a few minutes to what BJ has to say. Are we on? Okay. So I texted Rick last night and I tried to get out of this. I said I was too tired. I had an earache. I don't know. A lot of, lot of reasons, right? How many did I give you? Four or five, maybe? And he said, no. No, you're not getting out of it. So, you know, I think my story's pretty boring, um, but maybe somebody will find some good in it. Um, this is a story about a man who just kept running from God. And really, uh, I, I cried, too. I cried at my own wedding. Uh, and really just kept turning his back and, and a God that just wouldn't, wouldn't let go of me. Um, so if I get about 10 minutes of your time, is that, is that cool? Are we good with that? Okay, so that's it. You got set your timer? Okay. So I was born in New York uh, to, a, to a, you know, I'll say, quote, Catholic family. We went to church maybe twice a year, um, in traditional Christmas and Easter. Um, what I learned about church was that it was really boring. Um, the leaders were very authoritarian. There were a whole lot of rules, and I just really didn't enjoy it. I... The last time I went to church as a child, I was probably about nine or ten years old. Um, I don't really know. And I didn't go to church again for probably 14 or 15 years. Um, I had no relationship with God. I was certainly not a fan of religion. A, a funny thing happened when I was in high school. Remember, I'm growing up in a, in a house that isn't particularly religious. Uh, but a series of books showed up in my house. It, Many of you may have heard of it, the Left Behind series of books. And if you don't know the, the story, it's, the, it's, it's sort of a fictional account of what the end of days may look like. Um, it's a little sensationalized, but it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty good story. And I read those books, and I would say I was intrigued. I started to think you know, that there might be more uh, to this life, um, you know, that there might be a God, there might be a creator. And, and recall, you know, there were several years I would say that I told people I didn't believe in God. I didn't, I had no relationship with God. I think there were one or two times I actually called myself an atheist. I don't even know what that meant when I was 16, but it sounded cool. But even after reading those books, I would say I still wasn't really a believer. I knew that there was a God. I would, I would say I was agnostic. I knew that there was a man called Jesus, but I, I didn't really believe, didn't believe in him. So then college happened. Oh, college. I did a lot of things in college. <laughs> I won't tell you all about them. But I did a lot of things uh, that were good. I studied. I got a degree. I did a lot of things that uh, were not so good, were not honorable. But there's one really specific thing I remember about college. And I was in a fraternity, so, you know, don't look down on me. But, uh, I lived in a fraternity house, and it was pretty much like you'd expect. But on my wall, next to my desk, there was a little post-it note. And on it, I wrote this. Remember why you're here. And next to that, I put a little cross. So through everything, I just couldn't get away from him. I tried to get away from God, and I just couldn't. When I was a junior in college, I met, I met an extraordinary woman. She's right there, red shirt. <laughs> and she was a believer, and she was raised in a family of believers. And she brought me to church, <laughs> First Baptist of Daytona Beach. See, I'm... I'm painting a picture. I just couldn't get away. I tried and I tried and I tried and I just couldn't get away. And my eyes were open to what church could be. <laughs> but guess what? Never went back. 
Well, that girl who brought me to church, uh, she eventually became my girlfriend, my fiance. And when we were looking for a place to get married, we found a small church in Palm City, uh, Calvary Chapel, and we wanted to get married there. And so we started attending, and uh, we went for a couple months. We couldn't really remember last night how long we had went, went but maybe two months. And sadly, I have to admit that the day we got married was the last time I attended that church. See, I just kept running. So many years later, we found our, we had our first child, and uh, we did. We made it back to church. It was a little place called Coastal Life in a warehouse off of Dixie Highway. And I was moved. There were two men there, uh, Rick Evans and Todd Mazingo. And I was moved. I really was. I was excited. These guys, in my opinion, just got it. And what did I do? Stop going. Still wasn't a believer. See, God kept reeling me in, and I kept wiggling off the hook. So later we decided uh, our son was getting older. Uh, my wife was pregnant with our second child. And we decided that we're going to go back to Coastal Life. It was now in Palm City. And, and frankly, now we were actually giving it the effort. We really were. We tried. But we just weren't moved. We just weren't. For some reason, it just wasn't working. Then something happened. And I don't think she's here today. I can't really see you all. It's kind of hard up here. But then something happened, a life-altering moment. And this is proof. See, we all want to, I think Rick or someone else said, we want to be zapped. Right? We want... We want God to open up the heavens and, and hit us with lightning. But God works through people. And there was a life-altering moment in my life, and it didn't even happen to me. But my wife went to the YMCA for open gym, which is gymnastics, and she met a woman named Bethany Nauman. And Bethany, on their first meeting, invited my wife to a tiny little church in Jensen Beach. Here, obviously. This is God just reeling me back in, reeling us back in. And we came here. I, I think this is probably the first time that we actually went to a church. Somebody invited us. And we came home. So my life has really changed since we walked through those doors. I used to dread church. Now I yearn for it. You would have never seen me in a small group, small group, excuse me, I'm 13 now. And I go to one on Wednesdays. I texted Rick, if, if you all remember, we used to do the hub. I texted Rick after one of those and said, you would have never caught me dead at church on a Wednesday night for three hours, but I'm actually enjoying this. I would have never have gone to a Saturday breakfast, a church work day, <laughs> no, no way. But these are minor compared to the way my heart has changed. <laughs> On a Wednesday night, right, right back there where, where Paul's sitting, I accepted Jesus as my savior. I was no longer ashamed, I was no longer afraid, I was no longer to stand in front of people and cry, no longer of worried about what people thought if I kneeled on in front of the stage. I was a believer. See, God reeled me back in, no matter how hard I tried. And I really wish I could say to you all that my life has been great since then. It has been, but some really bad things have also happened. I have faced some really difficult times in the past 18 months. I lost um, some people in my life in a real tragedy. And about a year ago, I found myself in a really dark spot. I had thoughts in my head that were really frightening. But it was this place. It was these people, you people. This family that saved me. It was the love of Jesus that saved me. I prayed to God one night when I was having a really tough night, and I... I asked God to really audibly speak to me. I wanted, I, I said, I want to be zapped. And he came through. That next morning, I woke up, and I heard a song just 
blaring in our house. I mean, there was no question that this, that the radio had been left on. And the song Soul on Fire came on. I'm sure you've heard it. And these are the words that I heard. I, and I had to write these in the little sidebar here. But in this darkness, lead me through until all I see is you. And I got up to turn the radio off, but there was no radio on. It was all in my head. Or it was God. I think it was God. My big sin was pride. I didn't want to let go. I like to be in control. My wife can attest to that. And God tried so hard to win me over. The life was too good. I didn't need him. And I wish I could say that if you accepted Jesus that your life will be easy, but it won't. There will still be bills to pay, cars that break down, mouths to feed, family struggles, elections, wars, tragedy. But having Jesus in your heart gives you hope that despite all of those things, you have eternal life. And God says that he will never leave you or forsake you. And if you turn to him, he will walk with you. My favorite piece of scripture in the Bible says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is that light. So how am I on time? <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm going to close here. I want to say thank you to this church, uh, this family. Thank you to Rick Tom, Nate, who's not here, Cain and Paul, everyone that's made this place what it is. And if you've accepted Jesus in your heart, remember that you've received the greatest treasure that there is. But if you're here today and you haven't, know that you're still loved. And know that God brought you here for a reason today. And maybe that reason was to listen to my boring story. But know that God wants you, like me, to stop running and to start listening. So that's my story. Thank you. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. This is what God does. This is what God will do. He'll take what seems uh, to be sometimes hopeless and dark, and he'll bring his light into it. And the sad thing is this, and this is a sad reality. I'm going to go sad on you all just very quickly, but then I'm going to come out quickly. The sad thing is you can go to church all your life and never know the Jesus that BJ just described. You can go to church and know the Jesus that he described and then get so caught up in this stupid habits of, did I say stupid? I meant silly. Destructive, distracting habits of this life and lose the peace of God and lose the joy that is Christ in your life. You can lose that. You can get so comfortable with being worried and so comfortable and so used to being depressed and so used to being in control and so used to being an enabler and so used to fighting every little battle yourself that you just basically go to church and you love the songs and you love the worship and you say you love God and you do, but you never let His power affect your life because... You're living your life as there, there is no God. Well, you, you sing. You appreciate God. You, you don't murder people. That's good. But this presence of God that BJ described, this hope beyond hope, this thing that Paul the Apostle said, you know, to live as Christ, like the purpose that Christ had on the earth and the joy that he had in the in the difficulty and the adventure that was Christ and then Paul said and to die even better because then all the things that you've been experiencing on this earth are made full at that point 
I started a message series uh, two weeks ago before Nate spoke last week, and it was called The Power of Your Testimony. The Power of Your Testimony. It's so interesting to me because the week before uh, BJ, I, I gave that message, I was preparing it and getting ready for it, and BJ called me and said, man, hey, listen, I want to give my testimony. I think God arranges these moments like this. Um, there was a, a new fellow in, um, in Jeff Cannon's small group. Uh, one of his neighbors he invited, and this gentleman said that the church that he was from in San Antonio, Texas, they had testimonies every single week. And I would love that. I, I wish that we could, if you are bold enough to give a testimony, or just if it's just 30 seconds of saying, I was blind and now I can see, I was lost and now I'm saved, thank God. If that's all it is, I welcome you. C call me, contact me, don't be shy. You know, it could be something as simple as, I don't know that I know Jesus yet, but I really like the way people treat me around here. I think I like what God does in people. That's it. You know, just simple things. Or more detailed, like what BJ gave. I welcome that. We welcome that because we need that. That's what this message is about. And the first thing, that the point number one that we made, we got like seven points in this message. I got to two in my first week. The first point was Jesus wants anyone who've exper who's experienced him, anyone who's experienced him, to tell other people about him. This is all throughout scripture. Jesus just, this is one of those points that I could give you. I gave about seven scriptures uh, two weeks ago that, to describe how and why God wants us to tell other people. It's just in the scripture. It's just the truth. Number two, point number two, never forget who you were before you began to follow Jesus. Never forget who you were before you began to experience the love of God through other people. Never forget who you were before you knew his forgiveness. You knew his grace. You knew his hope. You knew deliverance. You know, BJ talked about a dark time just a year ago. He was following Christ then. He was praying to God then. Why did he have such a dark time? Because dark times are going to come, whether you're a believer or not. Doesn't make it any difference that he is or isn't. Dark times are going to come. Life is going to happen. Hardship is going to show up. The difference is the man didn't bail on his family and leave life like so many people do and just fold. God used the church, the body of Christ, other believers to encourage him and to help him lift up and walk through it. And then the Holy Spirit in him encouraged him to keep on going. Never forget who you were before Jesus because, listen, if you do, you could easily become a snotty, prideful little Christian person who looks around at everybody else and says, I can't believe they're still doing that. When we forget who we were before Jesus, we can become judgmental, arrogant, little people judging everybody else. Always remember who you were before Jesus. It won't be depressing to you. It'll always remind you that you desperately need him. And yes, you met him way back when, but you better stay near to him now because you need him. Never forget who you were. And compare who you were then to who you are now and who you're becoming. Just stop and think back. I do that all the time. I was only 16. But by the time you're 16, listen, you can live a lot of life. You can know a lot of heartache. You can know a lot of trauma. You can know a lot of sorrow. You can know a lot of pain and insecurity and, and sadness. You can know a lot of that by the time you're 16. And though I had an incredibly loving mother... And I'm not just saying that because she's here today. But though I had an incredibly, but I'm glad she's here today. I had an incredibly loving mother. I had sadness and trauma and violence in my life through a father who just didn't quite know how to get it together. He wanted to do good. I know my dad wanted to do good. On occasion, he would start praying to God and things would get better. But he kept turning away like we do, we do, we do that. And my dad, my daddy did that. And it brought trauma and violence and anger and insecurity and sadness into my life. So by the time I was 16, I had known so many of those things, which has resulted in a sad boy, a deeply troubled kid. So many of my friends, especially the girls, would say, you're so weird. It's because I was weird. I had a weird sense of humor. I just wanted to fit in, so I said things at the wrong time. You're so weird. Those, ring, those words ring in my ears. A friend of mine, Beth the Pamphilist from New York, she'd say, you're so weird. 
you're just so weird, Ricky. But we love you anyway. But you're so weird. But we love you. Never forget who you were and who you're becoming. And, and, and here's the thing. Point number three, let the realization, this is where we begin today, this is where we pick up, let the realization of what you were like before Jesus and what you're becoming, let that realization bring praise to your lips and deep gratitude to your heart. If you don't remember what you were like before Jesus, if you don't remember what you were like before Christ and, and how you were and how you thought and how dark things were, if you don't remember that, you're not going to walk in praise and gratitude. But if you allow yourself to visit, allow yourself to remember what you were like, how messed up you were, how sad you were, if you'll allow yourself to go back there and not forget it forever, but remember it, it will bring, it has to bring praise to your heart for who God is and what he's doing. It has to bring gratitude to you. And listen, people who walk with grateful hearts are very different people. They walk with a level of appreciation and humility. Remembering who you were before Christ, you know what it does? It helps you grab hold of humility. It helps you become humble because you remember, this is what I was like before him. What would I be like now without him? Just more of the worst. I would be amplified lost, amplified sad, amplified insecure. And that realization brings gratitude to you and humility to you. And let who you're becoming because of Jesus bring praise to your lips and deep and sincere gratitude to your heart all the time. Now I realize we don't, we don't do that all the time. If you were a fly on the wall and you followed me around, I would swat you, but I, if you did that, you would see me say things and moments you'd say, oh no, oh. But you would hear before the hour's out an apology come from my lips to God and whoever I, I acted that way towards. Because I don't like the results of my bad behavior. My kids don't like it. My wife doesn't like it. And I don't like it. And I don't let it stand anymore. Humility is a wonderful thing. You know what one of the, the best things you can do is when you, when you mess up, when you just muck up your relationship and you say things that are horrible and you do things that are horrible. You know the best thing you can do is go make yourself humbly, sincerely apologize. It's the coolest thing because when you do it, you just can't do it and be prideful, can you? You can't sincerely apologize and be prideful. I mean, if you're prideful and you apologize, whoever you're apologizing to is going to like go, really? <laughs> like, hey, I just need you to know, dude, I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry. Okay? It's hard to meet your expectations. I'm sorry. That doesn't cut it. People won't receive that. People will call you out. Really? That's your apology? When you sincerely apologize and you make yourself, humble yourself, and I started making myself do this in my 20s because I needed to do it so much. It causes you, it enables you to walk in that humility. You have to grab hold of humility to apologize sincerely and then you'll find Walking in humility is, it's a good thing. It allows me to hear things clearer and to see things better when I walk in humility because what did Jesus say? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. What is God's grace? It is his undeserved favor. God's undeserved favor comes on you when you walk in humility and you can get there by apologizing when you should and sometimes when you're not even sure if you should. The Bible says if, you, if your brother has awed against you or he's like troubled at you, he doesn't, he's angry at you, it says go to your brother and make it right. It doesn't necessarily say if, you know, if, if you did it wrong or if you, if you messed up. It just says if your brother's in trouble, go make sure you're okay with them. Make it right. Humility is always good, always good for you to humble yourself. We as Christians can't be the, the prideful people of we just that we were before him a people in our culture we can't be that way we are to be inviting kind and generous and forgiving believing the best of each other
When somebody tells me, and, and this is my point, is that when you are remembering who you were and gratitude is coming from you and praise, praise is coming from your lips and that's happening on a weekly basis, sometimes a daily basis, you're going to become a person who wants to worship God. You know, BJ said it again. I'm going to be referring to you a lot today. That he, he wants to come. Church is no longer, I got to go. I don't want to go. I can't stand it. I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to worship God. What is that? I can't wait. My, I, it comes from the reality. <laughs> I was blind and now I see. I was hurt and now I'm healed. I was destructive. And now I'm helpful. I was hopeless. And now not only do I have hope, I can help others have hope. It, when you realize that it, it has to bring praise. It has to come out and like, God, thank you. And it, when you turn that corner and you begin to like, you don't care what other people think. You don't care. It's like God saved the idiot. And the idiot's happy now. And people will go, you're not an idiot. You help me. You say, yeah, but you know, you don't really know me. <laughs> if you really knew me. When someone tells me that they don't really get into worshiping God, because I get that on occasion. You know, I appreciate your church and everything. I just really, that whole worship thing, I don't get it. I'm just going to come for the message because I'm really, I like the, the intellectual stimulation. When they tell me that, Listen, I don't say it to them because they're probably not ready to hear it. And some, often advice unrequested is usually unappreciated. And I know that. But my thinking is when somebody says, I'm not really into worship. I don't really get into that whole, you know, I into gratitude. Ah. My, I seriously doubt that they've ever experienced the love and the grace of God. I doubt that they've ever experienced the, the great love and mercy of God. It's not religion. It is the love of God. Someone said to me once, it is not religion, it's relationship. And if you have a relationship with the most loving being in the entire universe, it's going to affect you and what's going to come out of you. Whether you're, and this is what's interesting to me, man. I worked with, uh, with junior high and high school kids in Nashville, Tennessee. And then eventually the youth group grew and we wanted to hire a junior high school guy. So that guy on the back wall, Paul Billington, my best friend, uh, after we had tried several people and nobody, they didn't find anybody to hire, they said, do you know anybody? And I said, well, I got this friend. He's great with kids. You might want to talk with him where they met Paul once and then they hired him because Paul is this, that kind of guy that you want to hire. And both of us work with junior high and high school kids. And we'll both tell you this. We've seen junior high kids Sixth grade kids now worship God with deep passion and gratitude because they remember what first and second and third and fourth grade was like and they remember how, how sad they were and how misfit they were and how difficult life was and when they prayed to know Jesus in fifth grade or fourth grade, something changed and something got better and they can't even tell you exactly what but they just know they want to do this and they, their heart is full of gratitude. And I've seen that same scenario play itself out in children and old people. How old was Mac, Mom, when he came to know Christ? 80-something? 83. My mom's second husband, this man who treated her like a princess, which is awesome, because that makes all of us happy when your mom is treated right, right? And this man had been exposed to religion, but not much of Jesus. But he knew enough about God to know how to treat people well. He practiced a lot of the things in Scripture when it came to how to treat people well. And I believe because of that, those good, he did, he did what he knew to do. He met a lady who did know Jesus. And eventually that guy at 83 years old, finally because someone came and asked him again, it wasn't me, it was a guy named Jeff Fields, yeah, Jeff Fields from a church in Port St. Lucie, kept coming and visiting saying, Mac, do you want to pray to know Jesus today? Mac, do you want to pray to know Jesus? Mac, do you want to? And one day Mac said, you know, yeah, I think I will. 
83 years old, he prays to know Jesus. Simple prayer, simple Lord, forgive me for my sins. God, I want to believe in you right now with my words. I confess Jesus as Lord. Be my God. I want to know you. Save me. Amen. That guy started changing that day. Suddenly he had a hunger for the Bible at 83. He had never had before. 83. 83 is old, isn't it, Mom? You're, that's how old you are now. It's old. But she'll outwork most of us. <laughs> that's what I'm shooting for right there. Listen. Somebody tells you that they don't believe in praise and worship, they're not into it, don't criticize them, don't tell them that they have, but pray for them because they probably have never actually known the love and grace of God. It changes you. And it comes through faith that's expressed through a simple prayer. God, I need you. Jesus, be my Lord. That's all that Mac did. That's all those teenagers did that Paul and I worked with. Hebrews 2.12 uh, 2, says this, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Who does that? People who have experienced God. Psalms 26.7 says, the writer says this, I am proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling of all your wondrous deeds. This is what it looks like to have experienced God's love. You give God's love. You're grateful for his love. And you, every time the church gathers to sing songs, you just want to just belt it out. Listen, if I gave all my affection to my wife, which is a good thing, and none to God, my affection for my wife would begin to diminish. I'm just going to tell you the way it is, the truth. If I begin to give my affection, focus all my attention on my wife and my kids, and I gave no affection to my God, my heart would over time begin to grow cold, and I would become distracted, and I would not be able to love my wife and my kids with the love that I need to love them with. When I focus on God first, somebody drew me a, a, a triangle. They said, here's you, here's your wife, okay? Here's you, here's your family. You try to focus on them, you're going this way. And you're never going to be able to get as close as you want. You're never going to be able to be who you want. And you're not going to have the power to love them that you need and the self-control and the self-sacrifice that you need to love them. But if you draw near to God, as you draw near to God and they draw near to God, look what's happening. You're getting closer to him. You're getting closer to each other because his love and his power and, and his spirit is in you and he's drawing you near to him and you learn more and more how to love the closer you get to God. That's a side note, wasn't in my message. You can just put extra money in the box for that one right there. That was really good. <laughs> Point number four. I'm talking about your testimony today. Your testimony, your story. All right, how do you tell other people about Jesus? How do you help other people come to know God? Your testimony. Number four, point. Don't overthink your testimony. Don't overthink your testimony. See, don't, you don't want to, you don't want to use your powers of persuasion to win people. Or, or use big words to impress people. Wow, you're really knowledgeable. And you're religious. How weird is that? You just want to tell the truth. See, that's what Paul the Apostle did. That's what Paul did. And Paul, listen, if you don't know about Paul, you should study a little bit about Paul. He was a super smart guy. He was like, you know, the, the, the front of the class, the A+. Plus. He, was a, he was like the, the, the top of the class. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the scripture. He knew the Torah. He knew the law. And he held it up and he worshiped that. And he ended up persecuting Christians because they didn't line up with what he believed the law. He was a smart, smart guy. And Paul the Apostle said this. Let's know what he said. In 1 Corinthians, he's writing to this church that he helped start the church and now he's in another city and he's trying to help the church know how to know God and how to love each other. And he says this, he said, listen, you will remember, friends, that when I came, first came to you to let you know, to let you in on God's master plan, the first time I showed up and told you about Jesus, he's saying, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I could have. 
I knew the big words. I knew the philosophies of there. I had studied them. I didn't try to tell you those things. I didn't try to impress you. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First, Jesus and who he is, and then Jesus and what he did. Jesus crucified on the cross. He goes on to say in verse 3, I was unsure of how to go about this and felt totally inadequate. I was scared to death, if you want to know the truth of it. And so nothing I said could have impressed you or anyone else. But the message came through anyway. God's spirit and God's power did it. I just gave you the words. I just said what happened. I just told you what the Bible said. And while I was talking, God was working in you. The power of God was stirring your heart up. I just love the way Paul describes this because it's so right. But the message came through anyway. God's spirit and God's power did it, which made it clear that your, little, you, that your life of faith is a response to God's power, not to some fancy mental or emotional footwork by me or anybody else. Listen, Paul's saying this. You just tell people who Jesus is according to what the Bible says, not according to your opinion. So that means you've got to kind of know what the Bible says about Jesus. And it's pretty clear and easy to figure that out. It's not art. And then you tell people what he's done in your life. That's what BJ just did. Listen, when I didn't know what else to say as a junior in high school, when I started trying to learn to share my faith with other people, I didn't know what to say. I was just starting to read the Bible, you know? But I, what I did say was, you remember me in like eighth grade, ninth grade? Yeah, you were a jerk. You remember how I was always in trouble? Yeah, you were always in trouble. Have you noticed a change? Yeah, you seem happier, man. You seem, you seem more relaxed. You don't seem to be like on, you're like on some drug now. I wasn't on drugs, and it was just, you know, Ricky. It was, um, it was hyperactivity in my brain coming out into my flesh. And people would say to me, you're different. What is that? And I would tell them. And I just prayed. This is what I told them. This is my great testimony. I prayed to God and I asked Jesus to forgive me for my sins and to come into my heart. And I know that sounds super religious and everything, but everything started changing. Dude, really? Yeah. And I had friends that would say, where do you find that in the Bible? And I'd say, well, it's here. And he knew, I don't have a Bible. Can I loan you one, one of mine? And I'd, I'd go get a Bible and, and give it to him, you know? And I had a kid that, that had my Bible for months, this kid. One day he gave it back after he had come to know Christ. I didn't know what to say. I like what Paul said here. I was fearful. I didn't know what to say. I just told about who Jesus is and what he had done. It's your testimony. Point number five. Listen closely to this one. When it comes to your testimony and your story, if there's nothing there, then maybe there's nothing there. If there's nothing there, no story to tell, maybe because there's nothing there. 1 John 5.10 says this, whoever believes in the Son of God, and this word believes is not simply, yeah, I agree. It's a belief that, that follows an action. We've taught, learned that before. It's the word pistuo, and it means a belief that has an after effect, a belief that has a result, that word. It says, he who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. It is in you when you believe. You don't have to go conjure it up or find it or read about it and make it your own. It will happen to you. If there's nothing there, if there's no story there, if there's no testimony there, maybe it's because there's nothing there. Maybe it's because you've come to church. And this is okay. This is what, look, BJ was coming to church, but he hadn't really come to know Christ. He was doing what he knew to do, weren't you? Mac was doing what he did, what he knew to do. He was just trying to be nice, that's all, until such time as God brought somebody there to tell him who Jesus was. Until that time that the Holy Spirit messed with your heart right back there during that worship service. It was during a worship service, am I right? Boy, we were singing songs to God that God spoke to him and said, you don't know me, you need to pray right now. If there's nothing there, it's not a shameful thing. It's like, you need to know there's more. And the reason that your heart's not filled with praise is because you've not known his, you've not experienced the great love of God. You've not experienced the mercy of God. Or you've been living, you have in the past, but you've been living your life like it's not there anymore. 
And you can know it again. You can know it again. How do I know it again? You do the things you did in the very beginning. You begin to pray humbly before God. You gather with other believers and say, could you pray for me? I really want to know God's presence again. Could you pray for me now? You know, you come down here and you turn around to this church and you say, I've been away from God. I don't know if I know him, but I really want to know him. Could you pray for me? I want, could you, and that's, that's, you want a big result? You do something big to launch it. And it's big when you come up and say to a whole group of people, please pray for me, I want to be close to God. When you confess before everybody Jesus Christ. I said two weeks ago in my message that one of the, one of the most important things in Christianity is that we confess with our mouth that He is the Lord. It's public confession. And one of you came up and you asked me, you wanted to do that, and I forgot before the service was over. But today, I want you to today, I want you to do that. And every week, if somebody wants to go up and just turn around and say, I want to confess Jesus is Lord. And I want everybody to know that. And if you see me in public, in Walmart, being a rear end, you can come up and remind me of what I said in church. Just be nice to me, please. If there's nothing there, maybe there's nothing there. And you can begin. Point six if you're not sure if you have a real testimony, if you're not sure that you've really experienced God's presence, ask yourself if these next few verses of what they say is true about you. If you're not sure that you really have experienced God's grace and His love and His presence and you don't have a testimony, ask yourself if what these next few verses say is true about you. Psalm 43. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Has that happened to you? Psalm 77 says, I will ponder your work, all your work, and meditate on your mighty deeds. Do you do that? Do you sit and just think about all God's done? Man, what he's done, his mighty deeds, what he's done in your life. Does that end your head? Is that a, a part of who you are? If not, you may need to ask him to come into your life, and you may need to c confess him publicly so he can begin with you. Galatians 2.20 says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Can you say that? So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is that true of you? Do you realize that? Do you walk in that reality? See, we've been led to believe that, well, this is kind of like, you know, this is what's really happened. And even though you never really feel it, and even though it really never, this is what happened when you said that prayer. And so you're saved now whether you feel it. Even if you never, ever pray again, even if you never feel God's presence, you can go off and kill somebody, you know, and you can murder a lot of people. But as long as you did that prayer when you were young, see, you're all good now. And the Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. It says that public confession of faith is going to res it, it results when you believe, and that word believe, is, it means when, when things change because you believe. Repentance isn't, I repent. Repentance is walking one way and going, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm done going that way. I'm going to go this way now. That's what repentance means. It means turning around and going the other direction. Now, I've got to say this. First John, as I begin to close this section of this message. First John 5, 1, 1 through 21. Listen. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, has been born of God. All right? He's just saying a fact. If you believe that word pistuo, believe that Jesus is the Christ, then you've been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. Which means, if you're a Christian, you just love other Christians. You just love those who, you just have this special, unique, yeah, you love everybody, but you just have this incredible draw. I, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to Josh because I got to marry those guys a couple of weeks ago and they love Jesus. And I get this draw in my heart, man. I just love this guy. I love Jesus in him. There's this connection, the spiritual connection. You know, I, I walked in that room today and Zach came up and gave me a hug and it's like, man, I love you, man. There's this connection. It's a spiritual thing. It's more than just, you're a great buddy and I like drinking with you. But, but it's not that. It's, it's, it's connection. It's this deep spiritual thing that can only be described as fellowship in the scripture, this deeper thing. And, and, and he, Paul says here, I love this. And Jesus is saying here, if, you've been, if you love the Father, you love those who've been born of him other believers. By this, we know that we love the children of God. By what? By this, now, we know that we're believers. By what? When we love God, and can you read the next section with me? When we love God 
and obey his commands. Say that with me. And obey his commands. That is the proof. I don't want to obey his commands. They're hard. A lot of the things I want to do, I won't be able to do. But I want to feel better about myself, so I come to church. And the band is good, so I like them. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. Listen, for this is the love of God. What is? This is, right here, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. They are burdensome if you don't know Him, if His, pre if His Spirit's not in you, if you've never experienced them. They're really hard. But not if you know Him. Not if you've experienced his love and his grace and his undeserved favor, his grace in your life. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Believing in God. Believing in him. Point eight, my final point. What happens because of our testimonies? What happens when you share your testimony? What happens because of it? What's not going to happen if you're not sharing your testimony? Revelation 12, 11 says, and they, meaning us believers, and they conquered him, who's that mean? Satan, the enemy of God. They, us, conquered Satan by the blood of the Lamb. That's what Jesus did on the cross. The sacrifice made by Jesus. The blood of Christ covering our sins. The, way, the open door now for us to know who God is and know Him experientially. They are saved. He, they, Satan is conquered by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. A better translation of that says this. And they conquered Satan... Not by, but on account of the blood of Christ. Because of the blood of Christ. And on account or because of their testimony. In other words, it's because of us telling our story of who Jesus is and what he's done for us and in us. It's because of that that Satan will be defeated in the lives of the people that we tell. The people that we tell and the ones that they tell. In the early 90s, uh, I was a youth pastor at a church in uh, Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, Columbia, Tennessee. It was called New Life. And I did a retreat, a youth retreat. We take kids away for uh, four days, three days, and we, we get with them when we don't indoctrinate them. We just let them have a ton of fun. And we sing songs to God at night, and we just teach truth. And, that's it. and we give them a chance to pray with each other. It is life-changing, life-changing. And, and on one of the nights, at the end of the night, I said to the group of about 30 kids, I said, listen, if you want to know Jesus tonight, I just want to lead you in a prayer, and you can know him right now. That's all I did. I did it every night. It's nothing special, right? It was just, just words. And I, I just threw these words. I did. The words contain truth and power, but because they, they, they had God's word in it. So I said it. And I said, so pray this prayer with me. We want to know Jesus. I said this prayer, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I want to know you, and I don't want to live my life anymore. I want you to give me the life. And I just said a, a prayer, you know, that they contained all the elements of wanting to know Christ. That's all. After it was over, this kid came and walked up to me. He was a friend of a snotty kid. There was a snotty kid who came who never paid attention, threw stuff in people's hair during the messages. He was just sneered at me all the time. Snotty kid. But he brought a friend. And the friend came and walked up to me after I shared this message. And he said, um, Rick? I said, yeah. He goes, uh, my name's Nathan, Nathan Sloan. And he said, I prayed that prayer today. Kid was in eighth grade. I prayed that prayer today. He said, ah, I just wanted you to know that because I want to be a Christian, man. And I said, well, Nathan, that's awesome, buddy, you know. I wonder if they quit hanging around with that snotty kid that brought you. I didn't say that. I said, can I pick you up and make sure you make it to our youth meeting? He said, yeah, man, because I can all have a ride. So I went by his house the next week and picked him up on a Wednesday night for our youth meeting. And I dropped him off every week. Every week I did that. And then when Nathan was like a sophomore in high school, his mother got transferred. He had no father. He had a single mom and a troubled brother. And they moved away, and I didn't hear from him for like three or four years. I didn't know what happened to Nathan. I just knew he prayed to receive Christ in those simple words, and he came for a year or two and came to our meetings, and he seemed to be getting it, you know? He's a good kid. I like Nathan. 
I hear from him now, I, I, it's four, four years later, five years later, he's now in college. And he calls me and he says, Rick, hey, yeah, Nathan, how's it going? Dude, yeah. He goes, what are you doing? I'm, he said, I'm a youth pastor at a church. That was excitement. I said, really? He said, yeah. He goes, and listen, we're doing this retreat, and could you come lead the worship for this retreat? And I said, yeah, man, I'd love to. So I led the work. I went, I met him at this cool place, Fall Creek Falls, I think it was, and, and we met at this retreat, and then we got a hug next, and, and he had 30 or 40 kids that he's sharing the gospel with, right? Then I don't hear from him for a couple of more years. The next time Natalie and I hear from him, he's a missionary in India. This little kid who just said a prayer shared that same message with dozens and dozens of kids and then hundreds of people in India. He's still following Christ today and it started with a simple prayer, a simple words, humble words of Jesus, I want you, I need you, I accept you. And I invite you today, if you don't know that you know him, I want to invite you today to pray that prayer with me right now, right now, okay? Let's just close our eyes and pray right now. You can pray out loud or you can pray, pray quietly. God hears your prayers. The first time I prayed, I prayed completely quietly, but God heard my prayer. So just pray this to God if you want to know him. God, I know that you see me now. I'm sitting here in this place repeating these words because I want to know you. God, I want to know you. And I need you to forgive me for my sins. So God, I'm agreeing right now that I'm a sinner. You know, I, I got issues. But your word says you love me and you'll forgive me if I'll ask. So I ask you now in the name of Jesus, because of who Jesus is and what he did, God, would you forgive me for all my sins and wipe them away, Lord, like words on a chalkboard. Just erase my sins, God. Would you help me, God? Help me grow and know you. Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I don't want to be the Lord of my life anymore. I want to live for you. Help me. Help me, God. I'm praying to you now because I'm expressing my belief now with, with my prayer. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That simple prayer is where it began with me and almost every member of my family. I think every member of my family. And so many people over the years started with that prayer. Today we're going to stand and just sing through this song one time. And I invite you, you come down if you want to like... The person who came down the first week, come down this week and you can confess to these people, I want to confess Jesus. You come down here and say to me, I just want everybody to know I'm going to, I'm going to follow Christ. I don't want to play games anymore. I want to, be, I want to seek Him. Or I'm a Christian, but I want to be on fire for God. I don't want to just play the edge anymore. So let's stand. Let's sing this song. And uh, you know, come on down here and commit your life to Christ today.